Hello everybody, today is the beginning of something a little bit different for me, a very personal and special journey that I would love you all to join me on, because today I am at long last beginning the process of restoring my grandfather's motorbike. <laughs> And this is that motorbike. What is it? Well, it's a Triton. In other words, it is a combination of a Norton frame with a Triumph engine. Way back in the 1950s and 60s, it was generally regarded that Norton produced the finest motorbike frames, this being an example of their featherbed chassis, and Triumph made the best engines. Because neither of those were particularly complicated, it was pretty popular for people to simply take the Norton chassis and stick in a Triumph engine. Many of them got modified into what's known as a cafe racer. Those are the ones with the nice low fronts, the kind of kick back at the rear, often in a black and silvery paint scheme, the sort of bike most associated with the 1950s and 60s biker scene and places like the Ace Cafe. This one though is very different because it is as basic as a Triton can be. It is essentially an unmodified Norton frame with an adapter to fit a Triumph engine. That's it. When I say this is my granddad's motorbike, I really do mean it. I don't know everything about this, and sadly, I may never. However, here's what I do know. I believe he was actually the person that made the modification, built this motorbike. It was registered in 1967, because that is, I believe, when he made the conversion. At that time, he would have been 17, and I was told that as a teenager, he used to ride this to work. So, that all tallies up. However, it has been off the road since 1995. He died in a motorbike accident in 1999. So ever since, this has been one of the largest and most personal mementos that I've had of him. It has been staring at me for quite some time now, and I've been meaning to try and get it restored, but a few things were in my way. Firstly, for a very long time, I didn't really have all that much money for essentially passion projects. Happily, YouTube has now changed that. The bigger issue though was trying to find somebody that I entrusted with this significant piece of family history. And happily last year, I bumped into the perfect person because I needed some rewiring done to my house. And as I'm sure anyone that's tried to find an electrician will attest, trying to find a good one that you can trust is nearly impossible. I was absolutely delighted when I found one called Simon, lovely chap, XRAF, who was very passionate, very professional, and very nice. Unfortunately for me, as soon as he'd done all the rewiring on the house, he said, yep, cool, there we go, thank you very much, that's it from me, I'm out of this game now. And I said, oh, that's a tragic shame, it took me ages to find a Sparky that I trust. What are you doing next? And he said, I'm going into what I'm really passionate about. I'm gonna start restoring old motorcycles. So I said, ah, I think I've found the person I've been looking for to tend to this. The old British bike world is rather cliquey and full of very interesting characters. I've never managed to successfully navigate it, so I was delighted when I found someone that I knew who had the skills to do the job and that I trusted. So then, what is it that we're actually trying to do? Well, I spent a long time thinking about how really to approach this, because it's not simply an old motorbike. It's my grandfather's old motorbike. So ordinarily, if I had something like this, the first thing I'd have done would be respray it. But that's sacrilege. I want to try and maintain as much of this bike as I possibly can. Luckily, it has been in dry storage for the last quarter of a century, which means in overall terms, the condition is actually pretty good. What we're really doing, I suppose, is more of a recommissioning than a restoration. I had actually begun doing things to this bike about 10 years ago. I sought advice from a few people that I trusted and they told me, okay, what you do, get the old oil out, which by then had turned to jelly. These don't really have an oil filter as you'd expect in them. It's more of a small sieve at the bottom. So I did that, put some fresh oil in, turned it over a few times, drained that oil, then filled it again. I also had a friend of mine take the fuel tank away and try and clear the inside out because that naturally was full of crud. We'd done that, I'd also had the carburettors rebuilt and I got to the stage where I wanted to try and turn it over to see if it would fire into life. 
Unfortunately, the carburettor rebuild didn't go quite as planned, and I think one of the gaskets wasn't right, so it was leaking fuel. The last thing I wanted to happen after having seen Grander's bike sat there for 15 years was then see it burn to the ground, so I stopped. And then for the next 10 years, didn't really do anything. A month ago, I had the bike carted over to Simon, who's now had a chance to go over it. Generally speaking, the news is very good. Because the bike has been properly stored, most of the corrosion you can see is simply on the surface. It is essentially decorative. And I've made the decision that I want to try and maintain the bike's visual condition as much as possible. Anything that is structurally concerning, of course, is going to be tended to, but the rest of it is going to be merely cleaned up and preserved. The only piece we're talking about replacing at the moment, which will be obvious, is the wheels, because there is an amount of corrosion on them, and we're somewhat nervous about corroded 60-year-old wheels. I also believe at least one of them is bent, and yes, you can fix it because it's old-fashioned spokes. However, it may just be easier and more sensible to just replace and then keep these for essentially show purposes. Though today this looks like essentially any old British bike, it was actually something of a marvel for its time. The Norton Featherbed chassis was a real innovation. It was, as you might imagine, quite light and it came from Norton's desire to have a stronger yet lighter chassis to use in racing. Previously their bikes had been very durable but quite heavy. They then experimented with a more lightweight frame but found that it would break and that you do not want. So this design was commissioned which I may talk about in further detail in an upcoming video which essentially has these two sections here connected by several key points. This was very strong and very lightweight. It was regarded as the best handling frame of its type for a very long time, and is why it's still revered now by old bike enthusiasts. The engine here comes from a Triumph Tiger. It's a T110. There were two popular engine choices for Tritons. You could have either this from the Tiger or the engine from the Bonneville. The Bonneville was the higher specification twin carb version. This has only one carburetor. Because of that, it is slightly down on power, but this is regarded as being far more reliable and easier to maintain, which is probably the reason Grandad went for it in the first place. The gearbox is what they call pre-unit. In modern motorbikes, the engine and gearbox are all together in one casing, but here they are not. That's your engine, that's your gearbox. For modern bike enthusiasts, something also to note, the gear selector is in what you term the race position. On most normal motorbikes, the gear lever is over on the side, operated by your left foot. Click down for first, click half up for neutral, and then second, third, fourth, and so on. This is on the opposite side and goes the opposite direction. So click up for first, and then down second, third, and fourth. I believe it only has the four gears. Grandad was certain this bike was good for the ton. 100 mile an hour. However, my father tells me that when the two of them went out on their bikes in the 1990s, that did seem a little optimistic. If you wanted to get 100 out of this, you needed a rather large hill. Worryingly, one thing you didn't need if you wanted to take this bike out was a key. I'm told it was a difficult so-and-so to get started and would happily kick back if you got it wrong, but there is no key whatsoever. To ride this, you get on it, turn a switch and kick it. That's it. So as part of the recommissioning, I am going to have a key installed because the last thing I want to happen is to get Grandad's bike all nice and ready to go and then somebody goes away with it. It isn't worth a massive sum of money, some thousands of pounds. In truth, the value of it, of course, is irrelevant. If it was worth a million quid, it still wouldn't be sold. It's my granddad's old bike. I'm sure some of you watching have no idea whatsoever that I was into bikes at all. But the truth is, I actually got my bike license before my car won. The reason being, I figured if I could persuade some family members to help pay for my bike license, my parents would then realise that me having a car license would be very useful to get them home from the pub, and so they'd pay for that. If I already had a car license, there was no logic in them getting me onto a bike. The ultimate plan for this is quite a simple one. A couple of times a year on a glorious day like today, I want to hop on the bike, go down to the local country pub, chat to a load of other bikers, have a pint of Diet Coke and ride home and remember my granddad. That really is the extent of it. Nothing grand, no big road trips, nothing fancy, just a simple, honest little bit of enjoyment with an old bike once in a while and some very fond memories. 
Handily, unlike old British cars, old British bikes are pretty easy to get parts for, which means that anything we need for this, we can get, and if we can't get it, we can make it. Simon's had a good opportunity to go over the bike, and generally speaking, it's in decent condition. As soon as we're done filming, the next step for him is to crack the heads off the engine and see what the internals looked like. As I turned it over 10 years ago, and it seemed fine, and the bike has been properly stored, we hope that the engine doesn't really need anything, at most a top-end rebuild, which is fine because on something like this, it's pretty simple. The fuel tank needs lining. Hilariously, when it was cleaned, it was done the old-fashioned way. Chuck bolts in it, wrap it in a quilt, sling it in a cement mixer and it turns out some bolts are still in it, which I didn't know. The carburetor will also need going over. It was ultrasonic cleaned years ago, but I believe one of the gaskets still needs tending to. The wiring loom on the bike needs replacing, and luckily, as an RAF trained electrician, Simon is perfectly qualified to redo all of that. The bike runs a six volt system, which we are going to maintain. That was one of my questions for him. Are we gonna go six volt or move over to 12? And he says, there is nothing wrong with a six volt system, provided it's in fine fettle. There are a number of things on the bike that Grandad has evidently done over the years. Where possible, we're going to keep those, but where need be, we're going to replace them or upgrade them. One of the only things we definitely have to tend to and change visually is the seat. Under this cover, it's a very natty looking sort of tweed vinylish looking thing that has definitely seen better days. So this is going to be recovered to as close to OE specification as we possibly can. And Grandad's old seat cover is of course staying put. The next step after that will be essentially service items, brakes, tires and the like. As you can imagine, they're all old and past their sell-by date and I am not taking any chances with that sort of stuff. With luck, the next video you see featuring this motorbike will be it in a state of disrepair. The car SOS, take the blanket off, oh my word, what have you done to Grandad's car moment. If you've got any questions about the bike, about the process, or even better, if you happen to know something about this that I've either failed to mention or got wrong, please hop into the comment section and tell me. I want to learn and know as much about this as I possibly can, and that's information I will then share back with the rest of you. Then, if all has gone to plan, I don't want to make this too long a series because ultimately you're here for the cars, not the bikes, but in part three, we will try and get this fired up for what I believe is the first time in 27 years. At the absolute minimum, it definitely hasn't run in 23 and hasn't had an MOT since 1994. So that's going to be quite a big moment. There we have it. That's an introduction to this mini series. I hope it's one you're going to enjoy. Any questions, comments or feedback, pop into the section down below. Let me know. Hit the like button if you haven't already. And don't forget to check out Hangar Motorcycles Instagram and their website if you want to know more about the people doing the work on it. If you have an old bike and you're thinking of getting something done, I can highly recommend Simon. He is a great guy. From me, thanks for watching. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.